everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Get Wealth Podcast. I'm here with Rodolfo Like Lycon. I think I'm saying that right. A real estate investor, entrepreneur, does a little bit of everything, whether it's fix and flip, um, you know, long-term rentals, you name it, wholesale. And he's part of SoulPod, which is a, an operation. They're doing some uh, some some stuff at a pretty high level. So I'm excited to get into the details of that. And thanks for coming on the show, man. Thank you, Brendan. Appreciate it. Super excited to be here and, and thank you for the opportunity. Love it. Of course. Yeah. So let's just start off with how you got started in real estate. Where did that begin for you? Man, it's a long story. No, just kidding. Um, I started, so when I graduated from ASU um, back in 2012, I ended up graduating uh, in 2016. I started working for Gatorade. At that time, uh, I was a production supervisor and I was working night shifts, long, long shifts. I'm talking 14, 16 hour shifts. And uh, for me, I knew it was not going to, to be the route that I wanted to go, right? For me, it was never about corporate America. It was just kind of a uh, means to an end. Uh, and I really, really enjoyed the idea of becoming my own uh, business owner or becoming an, an entrepreneur. Um, Somewhere along the process, I stopped upon the um, Rich Dad Poor Dad book. Mm. It was a book that my dad had recommended a long time ago. I was probably 15 and I never listened. listened. So out of a miracle, I grabbed it um, like around 2016, 17, and it just clicked. Like immediately, I really understood what the difference between an employee, a uh, business owner, uh, an investor, and, and just a self-employed, uh, all the, the quadrants, right? And the difference between each one of them. And, and from that day, I was like, okay, I, I gotta be an, I gotta be an investor. I want to be an investor. As a matter of fact, I was saying, I don't want to be a business owner. I just want to invest. I want to put the money to work and chill. Right. That was like the, the Holy grail. <laughs> um, so that kind of, started picking my interest into what can I invest and and I started doing a little bit more research and, and obviously everybody knows the, the typical ones which is going to be the stock market um, I learned that you could invest in businesses you can buy them pretty much fix them up and increase the revenue and then sell them off and uh, obviously real estate so real estate was like oh damn okay what's how can we invest in real estate and, and with very little money, right? Because for me, as soon as I started to think that I wanted to be a real estate investor, uh, the next step for me was uh, basically going into Bigger Pockets podcast and YouTube. And for the, I want to say for like the, the entire year, that was kind of like my Bible. It was reading and listening and watching every single podcast or video that they could have put out. Um, and they preach a lot the long-term investment side. They preach a lot the, um, they mention wholesale a lot, but typically it's going to be the house hacking is going to buy, hold, rent, burst strategies, that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I was going that direction. I, I really, really wanted to just go into a full-blown buy and hold real estate investor. And um, yeah, dude, like that, that piqued my interest. As soon as I started like just learning a little bit more how to analyze deals, the first thing that I wanted to do was like, okay, I got to buy my first house. I got a house hack. Like I got to figure out. And not sure if you're familiar with bigger pockets or like you've seen some of the videos, but oh, yeah, all of them almost. No, nah, not all of them. Yeah. There's too many. <laughs> There's a lot of them. There's yeah. a lot of them. And Brandon Turner. Yeah. It's just insane. Well, he's not even with bigger pockets at this point, I think, but right, he was like yeah. a, a virtual role model for me. He, like I will listen to everything that he would say. Mm. and and they were they always push for the triplexes and the fourplexes right i was like okay you can buy it's a residential unit still so you don't need to get a commercial loan and you can live in one and rent the other three so i started just going crazy trying to find these things and it's hard in phoenix it's hard and when you find one it's not always in the most desirable area mm. it tends to be <laughs> in, in some rough spots right and you have you know, at that time I was, I don't know if I was, I was 20, man, I want to say I was 23, 24 at the time. So I didn't, I didn't know if I really wanted to just go and invest in a fourplex. Um, 
I kind of got into like the analysis paralysis for a little bit, trying to find that triplex and fourplex, which never came. Um, so I started getting involved with with my local uh, uh, RIA, Diaz RIA here, AZ RIA, right in here in yeah. Phoenix. And did that that was basically what opened the the floodgates. So for me, it was going to every seminar that I could have gone, getting more mentors, going to like different classes, and and yeah, basically that's by going to the Azria, that's when I started investing. I met my realtor there who helped me buy my house. And by 2017, I had my house and I was house hacking the house. And that's what like, that's what like basically got me into the door. That's awesome. So, I mean, um, one of the questions I have for you is one of the, uh, the perceptions I had when I was just learning about real estate. I think that people have a tendency to think there's this super high barrier to entry because you have to like save up for a 20% down payment on a $4,000 house or whatever. Was that the way you were looking at it at first, right after you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Because I know for me, I was a little bit turned off at first because it's like, okay, great. I don't want to wait 10 years to start investing. I want to do something now. Did you have that perspective? So, so I learned very quickly that I could put like a 3% or a 5%. Back then, FHA yeah. was like FHA, the loan, a lot of people was pushing for the FHA. You can you put you can just put three percent down. And thankfully, when I was working with Gatorade, uh, since I graduated as an engineer, I guess I kind of got into a higher t- uh, tier level on the salary side. I was like not huge, but I was on the sixties at mm-hmm. that time. So that would allow me to qualify enough to to buy my my first property. And I was able to since I was house. Uh, no, I'm I'm lying. So. I stayed with Gatorade for three for three years, and in that period, my whole job was to save at least fifty percent of my income. Like I was putting everything to the bank, so I knew that I needed to save at least three percent of whatever I was going to buy, and uh, I just kind of I, I I had to do it. So I I just started putting money aside. But yeah, obviously at the beginning when I didn't know about the FHA and the and the other loans, I was like, holy cow, I got to do, I don't know if I curse, if I can curse here, but yeah, yeah, holy, right. okay. okay. So um, yeah, I was like, yeah, there's no way I'm going to get a 20 or 25% uh, for, for, I mean, equivalent for whatever I'm going to buy, right? Whether it's going to be a $400,000 property or like, it's a lot of money. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So, that's scary. So, uh, I mean, right now you're doing all of it, you, you know, you got flicks and flips, you got wholesale, you're doing, you know, the whole game right now. So what led to that? If you talk to a realtor and you you bought a house and you're like, okay, I'm just going to keep buying more. And then wait, this one's in bad condition. Let's fix it up. Or how does that go? <laughs> no, actually, no, 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 actually. So, so in 2017, I purchased a house and that's where I was living. Right. I started bringing people, friends of mine uh, to live in the other rooms. Uh, the house was a four, four, two. So enough room for, for a couple of roommates and uh, um, I still needed to wait a little bit more on Gatorade before I could quit my job. I needed to be fully vested to get that full 401k match that they were promising so much. Right. So at the time, funny enough, I'm, I'm sure you met Miguel uh, here also in Soul Pod. Yeah. Uh, my partner and, and, and he was my roommate since 2016. So, Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, for whatever reason, I guess when we went to the house, my realtor was there, which I met through Azria. And at that point, my realtor kind of started talking to Miguel about potentially just quitting his job and becoming a realtor. He was explaining the whole situation with real estate. And, and I don't know, for whatever reason, he was like, yeah, I'm fed up with my job. I'm just going to jump into the real estate space. So he jumped into real estate before I could actually quit my job. By that time, once I was able to quit my job, he was working for a wholesale company here, uh, here in locally. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of Max, uh, Max Cash Offers, Max and Steve from, from Real Estate Disruptors. Yeah. From the yeah, podcast. Yeah. Yep. So uh, by, by the time I quit, um, I decided to also jump into the wholesale space. And that's when, that's when I really understood what uh, basically all the possibilities for me to call myself a real estate investor just because I bought the first house, obviously a huge achievement by that time, or at least it felt like it was a huge achievement, but I had no idea like all the possibilities. And that's what basically opened understanding wholesale, flipping, 
uh, all the different strategies, Burr, Airbnbs, and so on and so on. So on. That's awesome, man. So um, what was your the first deal you got? You walked through your first deal? Man, my entire first year, listen, I'm an engineer. I'm not a sales uh I'm not a sales guy. It's it's hard work. And for me, it wasn't something natural. So okay. I, I jumped straight to acquisitions. I was like, okay. And, and it was a whole shebang. So it was from cold calling, which is like A, if anybody knows whole says like cold calling is A, all the way to setting up the appointment, closing the deal and selling the deal and making sure that it went through. So I was going all the way from A to Z. Um, so huge learning experience. Obviously, I can say that it was probably one of the most challenging years of, of my life, just going through that process and learning curve. My first deal, um, did I think I did like, I made like $500. Like it was nothing. It was, it was $500. Right, it's proof of function. Yeah. <laughs> proof of function. It took me like four months to, to, to get my first deal. At that point, I had a little bit of sa saved up. So I was like, uh, I could sustain myself for almost like seven months. So it had to work, right? Otherwise, I would have to like look for another job. So it had to work. Um, yeah. The first, basically, the entire did the the entire year did I made a total of twelve hundred dollars, and that's equivalent to two deals. So those deals were super skinny, uh -huh. super okay. super skinny. So not a huge um, success on the first year, per se. Okay. So but the cool thing was that. There was a third deal that I locked up that day, that that year, and that year, I don't know if you've ever heard, but like the bigger the problem, the bigger the spread typically tends to be that that yeah, the, yeah, I've heard that. the way it works. The bigger the problem you solve, the problem the the bigger the spread is gonna be. So, I landed a deal that ended up paying me like fifty four thousand uh, dollars. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, so you went from like twelve hundred in equivalent to two deals to like the third deal paying me 54 and it just kind of, I mean, it took me out of the, out of, out of the fumes that I was running on my bank account, I guess you could say. So yeah. That was that's good. breath of fresh air right there. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, okay, this works. I can actually make money, make money with this. <laughs> so what was the problem that you had to solve? On the third one or the first one? The, the third one with the big spread. The third one was very interesting because uh, it was a, so it was basically a house um, that was inherited by four brothers, uh, brothers, siblings, so brothers and sisters. Three of them were um, in not good terms with the person that was living in the house, the, the fourth brother. Oh, great. I get in thought, <laughs> yeah, it, it, was, it was one of those. So I'm talking to the seller and basically he's explaining the whole situation where they've been trying to sell, but because the brother lives there, uh, they have never been able to accomplish that. And they just want to forget about the property. It's in horrible uh, condition. They don't want to be a liability for them. They just want the money and out. So after like coaching and negotiating at that point, I was still work, like trying to learn the game. We ended up buying um, uh, well, three quarters of the rights of the property. So a quarter per, oh. per brother because oh, wow. of because of the way they they had uh, um inherited the property um so each brother had a basically a 25 percent participation in the in the house right yeah and and i bought each one of their participations for seven thousand dollars so i ended up paying like twenty one thousand dollars for or not me but the company that i was working for <clears throat> um the last step of the puzzle was how do you get the fourth brother that doesn't want to sell, right? The, yeah. how, how, how do you convince the fourth brother that, that doesn't really want to sell? So going through all the motions of um, getting in contact with the, with the, with the brother, um, starting some dialogue, uh, trying to provide a solution. What is it that he wants to do? What is it that he's trying to accomplish? Obviously the house was in, 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 in very bad condition. I mean, he, he wasn't taking care of the, uh, of the property. And um, so after a few negotiations and a few conversations, we decided to, to, um, to pay him $40,000 for us to get the rest of the, the last piece of the puzzle per se. Dang. So I wonder if he told the other brothers afterwards. I, I don't know, but I guess, <laughs> yeah. 
I don't know. <laughs> uh, I guess it was Christmas wasn't good for someone in that that year, but uh, yeah. <laughs> But it is what it is. He ended up deciding to sell for, uh, at $40,000. And, and that deal, it was just a, a whale. This, this property was almost an acre um, with a 3-2 house on one side of the house. So you could technically subdivide, divide it into the lot, mm-hmm. just the lot, putting it on the market, sold for $180,000, just the lot. Whoa. <laughs> now, keep in mind, this deal took almost more than a year to come to fruition. So more than a year for us to be able to purchase. At that point, I wasn't even involved with the comp- with the, with that company. Um, at that time, um, after the negotiation with the fourth brother, the whole process continued. Uh, lawyers were involved. I wasn't part of it anymore, but like, um, obviously they had to, dis- once, once everything was taken care of, they ended up selling like the, he- the first half for $180,000, enough to pay closing costs and, any cost acquired by the time and whatever they had to pay to lawyers and anything like that, uh, and enough money to put into the house, renovate it, and sell it for like three hundred fifty. So the deal itself was like a profit of like three hundred and something. Yeah, huge, huge deal, which ended up paying me twenty percent of that. That's awesome! Wow, what a what a good good way to end the year for you, <laughs> dude. No kidding. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a good one. So. I mean, I think a lot of people listening aren't on that other side of, you know, successfully doing deals every single month. I'm kind of in a phase where I've probably had about one a month for the past six or seven months. They're not huge deals. Um, and it's kind of like building that traction is uh, can be difficult up front, like you were saying, as far as just the uh, the sheer amount of time it takes before you have a good deal. What are some strategies that you would give people uh, when they're first getting started as far as doing maybe their first or second, third deal? Um, And, you know, was that with cold calling and how do you have that mental fortitude to just keep going? So what I can tell you is like, based on my experience, once I, uh, Miguel and I decided to um, basically start our own company, right? And that was in March of 2020 when the pandemic hit. Um, We were only doing cold calling. With our budget was so low that we needed to do cold calling and we were cold calling. We were doing from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. or whatever the legal uh, time frame is, I think eight to nine, something like that. Um, the way that we would, just like you said, like obviously consistency and, and just like being on the phone day in and day night is going to... Uh, is gonna have huge results towards the end. So I don't know if you ever heard of uh, compound effect. Yeah. Um, so the compound effect for me was like huge because it, it, it taught me how to do little things repetitively over a period of time and, and the mm-hmm. results would pay it off or like you, there would be a, a result towards the end. And for me, really, I mean, don't get me wrong, it was hard, but we realized that every single no that we would listen was actually paying us money. So it's, it's a psychology game, but basically, basically it goes this way. Let's say that it takes you 100 calls, just to make, just to make the, the, the number simple, but let's say that it takes you 100 calls to close a deal. And um, once you close the deal, let's say that your average spread is gonna be, um, I don't know, $1,000. Um, in essence, that, in essence, every single no that you had previously to that yes that closed at ten thousand um, dollars, you can you can get a you can get a price out of that no, right? So ten thousand divided by by a hundred would be ten dollars per no, right? Mm-hmm. Is that right? A hundred or a hundred dollars per no? Yeah, there you go. A hundred dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. The engineer here doing math. Uh, so. So for us, it was like understanding that if we had a system in place and we were consistent with it and we would persevere at the end of the day, obviously um, putting a lot of effort and, and hard work and eventually was going to pay, pay off. And, and the way for us to continue to stay motivated was, okay, well, every no, let's figure out how much, how much money each no it's giving me. Let's see how much each no is, 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 is actually paying me. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're actually now looking 
it's like reverse psychology because now we were actually focusing on on disqualifying. Like for me, it was more important to find the no's faster than the yeses. And for me, it was okay. Every single time that I have the opportunity to talk to someone, is I'm gonna make like I'm gonna try to know as fast as possible if this is gonna be a good fit for me or not. Like if this person is actually gonna be someone that I can continue to have this conversation. Mm-hmm. So for me, it was more about. Um, the way that we do the script and the way that we still teach the script is by disqualifying, not qualifying. And I don't know, mm-hmm. I might be confusing or not. I don't know if that makes sense. No, I, I get it. And for the people listening, a qualified lead is, I mean, do you guys use the three pillars or whatever the four pillars of the we, condition, yeah. timeline, price, and motivation? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we use the four timelines, uh, the, the four pillars of motivation. And, and for us is, okay, if I'm going to talk to you, let me figure out why, like, let me, let me figure out why you're not going to be a good fit for me. Like, or why you're not, why we're just not going to be able to work together. If we can put that up front in the conversation and we're able to just neglect all that, like not, not neglect, but take, basically say, okay, you're not going to be a good fit for me because of time frame. Oh no, it is a good fit. Okay. You're not going to be a good fit for me because of price. Oh no, it is a good price. You're not going to be a good fit because of motivation. Oh, it happens to be motivation. Within five minutes, I know whether we're going to be able to uh, do business or not right that's awesome okay yeah so i don't know that was the strategy that that kind of worked for us and that's still what we preached that's okay that's cool so you you guys decided to go on your own after a little bit you closed a few deals with another group and then at what point did you decide it was time to branch out so we lasted oh i lasted about a year uh with max cash offers i obviously we learned the business we had the the I had the know-how now and, and I had learned a lot when it comes to sales. Now I was, I was able to handle better conversations, talk better the lingo of real estate and just close deals, right? So by, again, by March, 2020, when the pandemic started, we started working off of, off of my house. Um, at the time it was just Miguel and myself. We had four rooms. So we had, each one of us had an office and, um, and we started pounding the phone numbers, right? So we started calling every single day and it wasn't success. Uh, it wasn't like an immediate success. Obviously, nobody knew what happened, what was going to happen due to the pandemic, whether it was going to be a good thing or a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and and we started basically getting. I think the first deal that we got was within like three weeks, and that paid us like three thousand dollars. And all that money went back into the into the into the business. And then the second one uh, came over. Okay, like the second one popped up and that was like seven thousand dollars and it went straight back into the business for like the first five deals within a period of i want to say march till june july the first five deals like we didn't get a penny out of that it was all going back to the business um because we wanted better data we wanted to start texting as well we wanted to uh, potentially start hiring some VAs that could help us with the, with the, with the lead production, uh, cold calling. So all that money was being reinvested. Um, due to the fact, like, thanks to that, we were able to start hiring out people and we were focusing more in, in the income producing activities, which was closing. Um, and that's where everything started. That's where we started getting bigger spread deals. And we started collaborating with, uh, for instance, with Templeton. Mm. It's like, so we started bringing value to Templeton by sending deals. And we quickly realized that all three were, were we were working very well together. I, apparently he had a, a big network of buyers that would pay much, much more than what we had. And we were able to um, acquire deals at a very deep discount. So the match was it's kind of perfect. It's perfect, yeah. And and that's basically how it started. We started sell, selling him some. He's we sold him a couple of deals. He bought them from us, and then he's like, you know, you know what? I think I can, I think I can get more with this guy. So we started uh, kind of participating 50-50 on those deals, and then by July or August, when we decide to to try it out and like let's see if we can work together and like uh, partner up and start growing something. Um, by that time, we already had a, a small group of people working for us in the VA side. We already had SMS. We were doing 20, 
20, 25 S, uh, thousand SMS a day. Whoa. Yeah, we were like, we were going crazy on, on marketing. So that's when everything just kind of skyrocketed and we started getting huge momentum. That's so cool. I've, I've never done text message marketing. For me, it's just, I'm always on the dialer. What's a good um, starting point with text blasting? Is it worth it to send out like a thousand texts? Would you recommend doing like 10,000 at a time? At this point, at this point, I only do about a thousand a day. Uh, text message is not what it used to be. Okay. Text message was the most efficient and cheapest way to generate leads. And it was, I, would, I loved it. I, I had five different batch accounts and I was sending, I was sending 5,000 on each. That wow. was how crazy I was going. Um, I'm not a huge fan right now of, of texting. It still works and you're still going to get potentially that deal. But I would focus more texting into niche campaigns, um, lower volume. Because um, now when it comes to like delivery rates and, and response rates and the systems that offer SMS or blast SMS, are having difficulties with the new acts and with the whole things that are going like carriers are blocking the SMS and it's not yeah. as efficient. Cold calling is by far still one of the best ones and cheapest ones too. Yeah. So I, I actually tried hiring a VA back after my third or fourth deal probably was a jump the gun a little bit too much, but I had it enough saved up to last it for like three months. And that's kind of what their thing was. If you could do three months, then go for it. Um, but I ran into the spam issue with all my phone numbers because the VA was calling like eight hours a day, every day of the week or five days a week for, you know, three months. And so just, and I had a multi-line dialer. And so I would get like 20 numbers, but then it like, seemed like even within the day, they were getting marked as spam. Did you guys ever run into that? We always run into that and we're always buying new numbers. So what, what um, dialer were, were you using before? Uh, batch dialer. I still use that, but I'm just on a single line now. Um, and I'm not doing it. I'll like, I'll yesterday I called actually for like six hours and it didn't give me more to spam. So I think the single line dialer is safe for sure. But yeah. What do you think? Yeah. We always run into that. We buy a lot of phone numbers. So, uh, just to put it in perspective, I, I, I use call tools. I've used Mojo before I've used uh, batch dialers and all of them are great depending on what you're trying to do or depending mm -hmm. where you are at, at what stage you are right now. But I have, I have 15 VAs going to 20 uh, and currently hiring one a week. Uh, so the amount of phone numbers that we need to have and the amount of numbers that we burn through um, is obviously much higher. Now we are able to reduce the amount of phone numbers that we burn through by monitoring them. So we, we put to rest the phone numbers after um, an X period of, or number of minutes of, of dial time, excuse mm. me. So, so we can put them on pause, we'll let them cool off and we'll bring new, uh, we'll, we'll put some others to run. Um, we keep calling, we keep calling. Once they reach a certain period, we'll pull them, we'll pull them off of the, of the active phone numbers, let them cool off and just continue repeating that process. But yeah, it happens. It, we, we, my, my VA is probably by, so I have one that ad, and a VA admin um, and she probably buys phone numbers daily. One, okay. two, three, five, ten, 10, depending on the day. Yeah, got it. I was just curious because it seems like that's a progression over the last couple of years or so where it's just more frequently that's happening. Um, so it'd be interesting to see. If you're doing... <laughs> If you're doing a one channel dialer, or in this case, if you only do have one channel, um, I highly suggest that you go into a website. It's called Call Transparency, I believe. Okay. Um, I don't do it because uh, it's. Um, I'm sorry, something is. Um, I don't do it with my call tools because I have way too many of them. Yeah. And it would be very, it, it's crazy. And I'm changing constantly phone numbers, but I do it for my CRM. I have a couple of, of phone numbers for my CRM. And what I do is I register that phone number into call transparency, which is supposed to give you some, uh, I want to say some, some credibility 
Uh, it's super easy. You just gotta do a, a user account and just put it and register it, and that's it. And it seems to be holding up better. Um, okay, I think I've heard of something like that. That's interesting. Okay, I don't know how it works, but I did it, and it's working on my on my CRM side. That's awesome. Now, so I was at the the Soul Pod event. If you guys are in Arizona, you definitely got to check those out. It's free. They just yeah. provide a bunch of value, and all the biggest investors just show up there. It's insane. Uh, but I, I was at that, and I, you guys were talking about the realtor outreach, or I had a conversation with someone from Soul Pod talking about the realtor outreach. Outreach, and you guys get a lot of deals just from. From that, um, can you talk a little bit about your experience with working with realtors and is that an active marketing you're a part of? Yes, absolutely. So for us, SoulPod as a company is always trying to increase their community, right? And it's always trying to collaborate more with, with, with anybody, whether it's going to be investors, realtors, uh, newbie wholesalers. Um, really, if anybody is trying to get into the real estate space, uh, we would love to collaborate with them. And, and, uh, and yeah, for instance, last year we were able to buy uh, close to 260 deals and plus, I'm going to say 50 flips and a couple of holds. And the way that we're able to do that is not just because of direct to seller. I would, I wish it was possible <laughs> to buy one deal a day. That was our motto, SOPA deal a day. Wow. Uh, and we were <laughs> buying 30 deals a month or average 30 deals a month. And the only way that we can do that is by, having very strong relationships with with uh, the referral part of the business. So we have direct to seller uh, and then have the referral uh, mm -hmm. side. When it comes to the referral side, um, and when I say that we want to collaborate with everybody is that we understand that not a lot of people know how to take the deal from A to Z, or we understand that it's not their priority. But we, we also understand that there's a lot of money to be made if you just put a little bit of effort and a lot of realtors in, in, in the nation, but specifically here in Arizona, a lot of realtors typically um, will continue to be realtors and don't realize that they have the potential to put their investor hat. And they don't realize that they actually have a tool called the investor hat. So what we try to teach them is be an investor first. You can always rely on the on the realtor hat afterwards but if you do it backwards it's it may not flow as, as easy and i'll explain more into detail so typical realtor is going to have their lead their, their 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 leads right and someone is gonna he's either gonna represent on the buyer or in the seller side uh what happens when you come to a client or or get to a client that his property is distressed and uh uh, that really putting it on the market in this condition, you could put it on the market and investors will be all over it. But here's the caveat, the potential that the realtor could be making on that particular deal and still giving the solution to his client um, is going to be much greater if he goes with the investor hat. And what I mean, what I mean by that is that Instead of, instead of putting it on the market and then now you're representing the, the, the seller and now the seller has a property that is worth $400,000 and they're going to sell it for, I don't know, $200,000 for, for, whatever, for whatever reason. It's just completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen is that there's, someone is going to come in, investors going to come in, they're, they're going to start putting offers and then she might do uh, 3% or maybe if the investor is like nice enough, might say, oh, just take my part of the commission to try to persuade the uh the realtor to go on his side. And, and we don't do it that way. What we do is instead of you putting it on the market and instead of you getting only a 3% or 6%, uh, why don't you act as the buyer? Why don't you start using your investor hat and say, listen, uh, obviously you want the 200,000. I think I can give you that. I think I can purchase that property from you. Um, it's gonna be net to him. And by using us, they bring an ingredient and we'll cook the whole cake. So they bring a deal, say, hey guys, I have this property. The seller is looking to do this. This is the, the solution that we can offer to him because he's trying to solve X, Y, Z problem. From there, we say, you know what? It, it does make sense. We do want to purchase it. We'll partner with the realtor. We'll end up either taking it down because we want to flip it. We, and we might end up uh, wholesaling it to an investor that is looking to flip. Um, we have multiple strategies, right? Or it might go to a hedge fund if, if it qualifies for the buy box. 
And whatever spread we make, call it $5,000 or call it $50,000, we split it 50-50. Wow. So now the potential for the realtor to make $25,000, dollars $40,000 in one deal, it's very real. And, and for us, we accomplish multiple things. We accomplish solving um, someone else's problem. So, so the seller's problem. We give, we, we really open a whole world of opportunities to a new realtor that didn't have a clue that we could do this. And three, we are being involved in a deal that technically cost us zero dollars of marketing just based on collaboration. So it's, it's a win-win-win situation for all of us. And again, the realtor doesn't need to worry to, to perform. Uh, we are backing him out and we commit, we purchase it. We'll take a loss if we have to before we do not honor our word. And that we take that very serious. We bought 250 properties last year. We did not close. We did not uh, cancel in any of them. Um, we had losses, part of doing business, but we don't close. We don't, we don't back out. We, we will commit. So now you have realtors that are being backed by a big company that has the purchasing power to, to deliver. And, and, and yeah, they typically what happens is they don't want to be realtors anymore. They just want to become uh, <laughs> wholesalers. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's so cool. I mean, that strategy alone, like if for the first, someone hearing that for the first time who hasn't been exposed to that before it's a complete paradigm shift of how you can do things i mean i can't imagine if there's a realtor listening to this podcast and hasn't thought of that before their mind's probably like what is going on like i you know do all the deals with soulbot because you know when you talk about 50 percent of the profit as opposed to three percent yeah as opposed to three percent of the commission that's like a game changer so game changer. Are, are, are you so the say the realtor brings you a lead is she just like here's the he or she is she they, they say here's the contact info take it from here or do, are they locking it up and then assigning it to you how does that go there's multiple ways that we can work that the deal um we've done it multiple ways we've done it where they lock up the deal they have the the bond and report with with the seller and we respect that and and the trust may be involved there so we allow her to just go ahead and lock it up either on our behalf uh, and she can represent us as a, as a, as a buyer as well. And then still we will continue to honor the, the split, uh, or we let her know, you know what, just lock it up yourself. You can assign it later on. Um, so we've done it both ways. Um, and we've also done it by, by just trust. It has happened that a realtor says, you know what, I don't know what to do with this, but I think this is going to be a deal. Do you mind calling them and maybe closing the deal? And yeah, for sure. If it makes sense, we'll analyze, take a look at the situation and uh, we'll go to the appointment, call in the phone and say, I think we can work this out. We lock it up. Uh, and, and, and that realtor is still part of the deal. Still, we still honor the, that participation. That's awesome. Now, do you think there's a certain amount of uh, credibility that you have to build with the, within your community or with these realtors before they actually start trusting you with, with leads or how does that work? Can you just cold call enough realtors and then eventually you're going to get a lead that's a deal? No, 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 no. The reality is that we have tried to cold call realtors and we have tried to sometimes SMS, like target realtors. But uh, if I'm honest with you, our most fruitful um, relationships have been those that are, um, that are very involved in the day-to-day -day with us. So those people that are coming to the Soul Point Meetups that understand what our values are, uh, how we operate, the level of integrity that we have within the group, and, and the word of mouth is just, uh, it just takes care of, of itself, right? My goal, yeah, my goal is to present this amazing opportunity to any realtor and allow them to see for themselves what we bring to the table. Um, by no means I want a realtor that is gonna be um, completely, I don't mind the excepticism, like ex exceptical, yeah. Sorry, the second, the, uh, second, second language. Uh, but yeah, just, <laughs> I, 
yeah, I don't mind someone being curious whether we're going to perform or not, right? It's, they don't know us, and that's totally fair. But, um, but there is, we can put things in place, and we can actually put documents in place by whether it's going to be a, uh, an agreement for sale or an agreement to uh, an, an assignment or whatever the, for us to honor the word, right? But uh, it comes a day in time that they will have to either trust us and, and work with us, or if we're not their cup of tea, I'm sure there's a lot of investors there that might be willing to work with them as well, right? So um, I think just by focusing on doing the right thing all the time and uh, fo focusing on honoring our word and continue to have high level, high integrity and, and, and high level um, personality around us, I think that kind of take cares of it takes care of itself and, and people will be attracted to that and yeah I, I i love it that's like my favorite part of you guys as a business model is you guys are able to provide so much value and it's such a profitable uh strategy for you guys you know it's a win-win and that's really what the best business is all about so and there's uh, no limit no limit yeah it's in their free leads it's just insane <laughs> yeah. um so Let's talk a little bit about what is soul pod. Like actually even the word itself is that in my mind, I think of a podcast when I hear soul pod, you know, but like, it, what does the word mean? Oh, coming soon soul podcast. I'm just kidding. Oh, okay. No, <laughs> no, no, really. Yeah. We're, we're looking into maybe doing a, we want to do, we want to be more involved in the, in the YouTube aspect and, and podcast, but soul pod, uh, I got, I need to get, give credit to, to Templeton. In my, if I'm honest with you, I think he was meditating, um, <laughs> I cannot even remember. I cannot even remember who he was meditating with or like the, the podcast that he was listening to. Uh, but he basically came up with the idea of, of soul and then the soul pod. Basically, um, we have a, we typically, what we always say, you know, soul pod is, is their values is always going to be faith, family, friends, hobbies, and then money. Mm -hmm. And money is only a product of doing the other four right and at a high level, right? So pro, uh, money is always gonna be uh, what is gonna fuel our faith, our family, our friends and our hobbies, but it's never gonna be the first thing. For us, it's much, much important to continue to have this family environment. Um, and and I believe Templeton kind of just, I don't know how, it, I mean, genius <laughs> name, I love it. Uh, yeah. But it was just it was just the pot of, of, of souls that are just, looking to get together and and uh really just trying to thrive and, and working towards always becoming better selves if if that makes sense like we're always trying to continue we're always trying to grow we're always trying to better ourselves have a um yeah be loving caring and and, and happy individuals and if we love what we're doing and, and we're comfortable in the environment that we are I believe we will be very successful at the end. So that yeah, is soul pod. I think so too. I mean, the the name sounds good. It's catchy. I was always curious, and that makes a lot of sense. So that's that's good stuff. Um, yeah, you, yes. you, guys, you guys definitely need a podcast or even doing like like vlogs or something. I don't know. You guys are all such cool dudes, and your what you guys are doing is such a high level. There'd be a huge audience for that. So you thank you. No, yeah. We're, <laughs> we're excited we we definitely want to uh put the foot on the pass and the on the gas pedal when it comes to being more more involved in the in the internet in, in social media and, and blogs youtube so we're working we already have our youtube video our youtube uh channel um mm -hmm. is slowly growing but there you go <laughs> hey, it's probably more than mine i got like 140 something subscribers <laughs> yeah yeah well i don't know i i don't need i have i need to check i need to check where we are on the sofa channel but um we'll yeah. we'll get it we'll get it up there we'll get it um uh, yeah, yeah. With, with a lot of subscribers so how, how many deals are you guys doing a month like right, right now what are you guys doing what's the plan is it just to continue like grow the real estate hedge fund is that the end goal or how does where does it go no funny <laughs> that you asked so so Solpa is a culmination of other companies, right? So Solpa as, as, as the core is a wholesale, 
we mm-hmm. that's our bread and butter and that's what we focus the majority of the time and the majority of the effort and that's where we get most of our income from um like i said last year we did deal a day so we were trying to shoot for the uh for one and business days business days Hol- uh, the weekends <laughs> we're chilling back but uh <laughs> but yeah so for us also is uh less wholesale that turned into uh the opportunity to start flipping so last year we ended up doing if i'm not wrong i think we ended up doing a total of 50 something flips um um yeah about 50 52 53 flips um um, so so that created the necessity of creating a new company which is still under the umbrella of salt uh so now we have the, the the flipping company right um then that also opened the opportunity to start uh, a holdings company starting building a portfolio of rentals so so we started diving into airbnbs long-term rentals uh commercial now we're we bought our first commercial building which is going to be the new headquarters uh Ooh. Yeah, it's super exciting. It should be done within five months from now. It's very close here from, from downtown Chandler. This will become an Airbnb. Um, so we're working towards continue to grow that uh, that portfolio. And then we also got into the birth strategy, right? So friends and family that wanted to invest, that were willing to lend the W-2 income and, and the, the, the qualification to get a loan, would mm-hmm. partner up with us. We would flip the house. They would buy it from, uh, from the company, and then we would reimburse them with, uh, with, basically the the spread would be split at fifty fifty between the company and and the partner, and that would be enough to reimburse the down payment from from the W two partner. So everybody was zero into the deal. Uh, they have to live there for a year, and then that becomes a rental eventually. Um, so that's what we do at a high level, right? And um, and by no means we're, we're slowing down. We're always trying to come up with different strategies, working differently with realtors, uh, um, ways that we can invest, development. Uh, I'm super excited because we we bought last year a big lot uh, in in Ray, very close to the um, it's over in Gilbert, very close to the uh, uh, Top Golf. Um, over at Gilbert. Yeah, yeah. And it's a county island. So we're going to be building two spec homes, two states, $2 million each. So that's, you know, those are some of the one and off projects that we get to participate on. And it's super cool. It's, 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 it's very exciting to be, <laughs> to be part of those. So that's what we do at a high level, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's awesome. What's, what's your favorite part of real estate investing? My favorite part of real estate investing Oh man, that's a good question. I, I, <laughs> I want to say that my favorite part of real estate investing is starting to solidify a, a long-term portfolio. Now, don't get me wrong. I love the money that, that, that wholesale produces. And I love the fact that wholesale can be standardized and automated to become a ATM. To answer your question about like, what do we want to do? Do we want to become a, a hedge fund? As of yet, no, well, it hasn't been in the talks, but when it comes to the wholesale company, more than expanding and like being in every single state and, and now becoming like a major wholesale company in the States, for us, it's more important about stabilizing it, systematizing it, putting uh, processes in place and automate it, automate it as much as possible so that it can just be a constant a uh, predictable ATM machine that allows us to reinvest that into wherever we want, whether it's going to be commercial, residential development, syndications, uh, buying in other parts of, 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 the, of the states or, or even in Mexico. Maybe we start a rental portfolio for vacation, vacational rental portfolio. You go to Cancun, you know. So we understand very well, and I think all of us, uh, Templeton, Miguel, and myself know that the potential that the wholesale company has by just stabilizing it can allow us for much, much more opportunities in the long run. Mm-hmm. So that's the vision right now. Um, yeah. My favorite part is long term. Yeah. Um, but wholesale is just stupid crazy. Dude. Like wholesale is it's amazing. <laughs> All of it. I love, I love real estate. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I know. Me, me too. So I'm I'm a full time commercial pilot, and by commercial pilot, that just means you make money flying. I'm a flight instructor, so it's I'm not at the airlines yet. That's on paper. That's like what I went to school for and everything. But dude, real estate is just that's all I think about now. That's all I do. And I don't know. I just, I, I'm leaning towards just doing that, but I gotta, you know, I gotta be able to right now. I can. Absolutely. Dude. And don't get me wrong. Like Miguel and Templeton are very, like the risk tolerance is very, very high. Mine coming from an analytical personality, kind of being an engineer for me was, it was always measuring risk and making sure that I could move on to the next step with some sort of cushion or net i mean eventually you gotta you gotta pull the net out and, and if you fall you fall but so you don't want to get into the anal analysis paralysis but i relay a lot to people where they're just still in the process of, of something needs to needs to click and they're just not ready to to just jump my opinion and my advice is just jump but i can relate to the thought of like no i gotta build a little bit on, on the back end before i'm ready to go so i relate yeah. I mean, for, I would totally just jump. That's like, that's my personality, but I just have too many other people that have invested so much into me to be a pilot. So it's like for me to, it to not work out the weight of that is what's kind of preventing. Cause also I got student loans. So I got bills and stuff I got to pay. So I'm going to have to close a, a couple more deals before I can really start thinking about that. <laughs> and that's fine, dude. And, and, and the cool thing about wholesale is that, it does, obviously you're gonna be much more efficient if you have a full-time, you're like, just, you're just full-time into wholesale, but that doesn't mean that a part-time wholesale, uh, I don't wanna say wholesale job, like uh, wholesaling part-time uh, doesn't pay the bills. It does, it does very well. We just put out a video saying why 2022 is gonna be the, um, why wholesale is gonna be the best side hustle for 2022. Like it still works. Uh, the rate may be different, and at the end of the day, wholesale is a numbers game. So it doesn't matter whether you're calling the entire day or you're calling half a day or as long as you're consistent, you'll get the results. It's, yeah. It's, it, it is what it is. It's not, a, it's not a matter of if, but but when. Yeah, that's, all. that's good advice. Thanks, man. Um, what's a good book? Real estate book, wealth book, investing. What, what do you like? Um, man, I have a few. So... Just for like for someone that is like doesn't know what the hell we're talking about, uh, go read Rich Dad Poor Dad. Right, mm -hmm. I think that's okay. the first one. At least is going to pique your interest into into becoming an, an investor and starting to put your money to work. Uh, for me, uh, huge fan of the one thing. Um, the one thing I think is Gary Keller. Is that? I don't know. If yeah, it's on, I've heard of that book. I've, I haven't read it. That's must be one thing. Book. Basically focuses on well basically talks about how you need to focus in in one thing and just be master at it um mm -hmm. obviously it goes more into detail and it's been a while since i read it but it helped me a lot to uh to focus on while i was doing cold calling or like to really narrow down to what my my passion was or like my goal was just diving all in into that into that uh sector mm -hmm. um the other one that i mentioned is uh the compound effect like a lot of people is so focused in, in, in the results that it's hard to continue to stay motivated because you just don't see, uh, you just don't see working out. Yeah. And, and what you don't realize is that the very little and minute decisions that you're doing every single day and the extra minute that you're hustling or as, and every single thing that you put your mind into to make this a success uh, pays you off compounded um in in a in a much much greater matter that you would even imagine manage so that's what the whole compound effect book talks about um and then i don't know i guess i read a lot of like like personal development and 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 just uh just to maintain my my mindset uh sane and uh let me think let me think of one of that Deepa, uh, Deepa Deepak Chopra, that's uh, uh, an author that I really love uh, to listen to. Uh, I don't know their, I don't know their, their, the name of the books or like the, man, 
I'm, I'm screwing this up, but like, I'll give you, I'll give you a couple of good books later on. And then obviously if you're into sales, go listen to never split the different go listen to any Sandler book that you can get your hands on. Um, those are good. Those are good books. Yeah. That's a good list. I'm putting them all down on my, my list for this year. So. Yeah. I don't know why, I don't know why the deeper Chopra books don't, don't come to mind, but those are good too, but it's just nothing related to business. It's just more about life balance and sanity. And yeah. it's important. Yeah. It's important. All right, man. Well, uh, to, to wrap this up, I always like to ask this question because it's the get wealth podcast. What is your definition of wealth? My definition of wealth. Wealth for me is the ability to do whatever I want, whenever I want, with whoever I want. Um, it's not just about money. It's definitely not. Um, it's, it's about being surrounded with the person that I love, the, the people that I love, the, the family, my friends. And, uh, and just enlo- enjoying life overall. I think wealth is much, much more than just uh, financially, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, if I can get those three, I'm set. That's awesome, man. Uh, that's a good, good, really good definition. Listen, man, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Uh, where can people find you? Social media, Instagram, all that good stuff. Social media, Instagram is going to be Rodolfo Licon, uh, R-O-D-O-L-F-O-L-I-C-O-N. Um, you can also find us on Soulpod Offers Official is the new Instagram, which right now is horrible because it just opened up. I'm working on it. Bear with me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, social media is going to be the best way to, to get a hold of me. And uh, I don't typically do this, but I'll, I'll do it here. I mean... I'll throw my phone number there. Um, oh man. All right. Yeah, let's see. Let's see. <laughs> let's see what happens. But uh 602-931-7901. Obviously, um, yeah, I would love to see any deals that anybody anybody has. And and if I can answer some questions along the way, happy to help. It's awesome, man. All right, everyone send your deals to Adolfo. Maybe not right now. You might get two people that text you, maybe not even one, one of them, including me. Um, but five years or so, your phone's going to be blowing up. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully. That's a goal. That's a goal. Yeah. It's already blowing up with realtors for my listing that I was telling you about. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, man, it's been a blast. It was a great episode. Thanks for coming on. Man, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. It was super fun and, and love what you're doing, man. So thank you a lot. And hope, hope to see you on the next Opa meetup. I'll be yeah. there, man. All righty, man. All right, everybody. Get wealthy.